May 20th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, 2 Samuel chapters 20 and 21 from the Old Testament. Now a wicked man named Sheba, son of Bichri, a Benjaminite, happened to be there. He blew the trumpet and said, We have no share in David. We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man go home, O Israel. So all the men of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, son of Bichri. But the men of Judah stuck by their king all the way from the Jordan River to Jerusalem. Then David went to his palace in Jerusalem. The king took the ten concubines he had left to care for the palace and placed them under confinement. Though he provided for their needs, he did not have sexual relations with them. They remained in confinement until the day they died, living out the rest of their lives as widows. Then the king said to Amasa, Call the men of Judah together for me in three days, and you be present here with them too. So Amasa went out to call Judah together, but in doing so he took longer than the time that the king had allotted him. Then David said to Abishai, Now Sheba, son of Bichri, will cause greater disaster for us than Absalom did. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him. Otherwise he will secure fortified cities for himself and get away from us. So Joab's men, accompanied by the Carathites, the Pelathites, and all the warriors, left Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, son of Bichri. When they were near the big rock that is in Gibeon, Amasa came to them. Now Joab was dressed in military attire and had a dagger in its sheath belted to his waist. When he advanced, it fell out. Joab said to Amasa, How are you, my brother? With his right hand, Joab took hold of Amasa's beard as if to greet him with a kiss. Amasa did not protect himself from the knife in Joab's other hand, and Joab stabbed him in the abdomen, causing Amasa's intestines to spill out on the ground. There was no need to stab him again. The first blow was fatal. Then Joab and his brother Abishai pursued Sheba, son of Bichri. One of Joab's soldiers who stood over Amasa said, Whoever is for Joab and whoever is for David, follow Joab. Amasa was squirming in his own blood in the middle of the path, and this man had noticed that all the soldiers stopped. Having noticed that everyone who came across Amasa stopped, the man pulled him away from the path and into the field and threw a garment over him. Once he had removed Amasa from the path, everyone followed Joab to pursue Sheba, son of Bichri. Sheba traveled through all the tribes of Israel to Abel, a Beth Maacah, and all the Barite region. When they had assembled, they too joined him. So Joab's men came and laid siege against him in Abel, a Beth Maacah. They prepared a siege ramp outside the city, which stood against its outer rampart, as all of Joab's soldiers were trying to break through the wall so that it would collapse. A wise woman called out from the city, Listen up, listen up. Tell Joab, come near so that I may speak to you. When he approached her, the woman asked, Are you Joab? He replied, I am. She said to him, Listen to the words of your servant. He said, Go ahead, I'm listening. She said, In the past they would always say, Let them inquire in Abel, and that is how they settled things. I represent the peaceful and the faithful in Israel. You are attempting to destroy an important city in Israel. Why should you swallow up the Lord's inheritance? Joab answered, Get serious. I don't want to swallow up or destroy anything. That's not the way things are. There is a man from the hill country of Ephraim named Sheba, son of Bichri. He has rebelled against King David. Give me just this one man and I will leave the city. The woman said to Joab, This very minute his head will be thrown over the wall to you. Then the woman went to all the people with her wise advice, and they cut off Sheba's head and threw it out to Joab. Joab blew the trumpet, and his men dispersed from the city, each going to his own home. Joab returned to the king in Jerusalem. Now Joab was the general in command of all the army of Israel. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Carathites and the Parathites. Adoniram was supervisor of the work crews. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, was the secretary. 
Shiva was a scribe, and Zadok and Abiathar were the priest. Ira, the Jairite, was David's personal priest. During David's reign, there was a famine for three consecutive years. So David inquired of the Lord. The Lord said, It is because of Saul and his bloodstained family, because he murdered the Gibeonites. So the king summoned the Gibeonites and spoke with them. Now the Gibeonites were not descendants of Israel. They were a remnant of the Amorites. The Israelites had made a promise to them, but Saul tried to kill them because of his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. David said to the Gibeonites, What can I do for you, and how can I make amends so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance? The Gibeonites said to him, We have no claim to silver or gold from Saul or from his family, nor would we be justified in putting to death anyone in Israel. David asked, What then are you asking me to do for you? They replied to the king, As for this man who exterminated us and who schemed against us so that we were destroyed and left without status throughout all the borders of Israel, let seven of his male descendants be turned over to us, and we will execute them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, who was the Lord's chosen one. The king replied, I will turn them over. The king had mercy on Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, in light of the Lord's oath that had been taken between David and Jonathan, son of Saul. So the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth and two sons of Aiah's daughter, Rizpah, whom she had borne to Saul, and the five sons of Saul's daughter, Mirab, whom she had borne to Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholothite. He turned them over to the Gibeonites, and they executed them on a hill before the Lord. The seven of them died together. They were put to death during harvest time, during the first days of the beginning of the barley harvest. Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, took sackcloth and spread it out for herself on a rock. From the beginning of the harvest until the rain fell on them, she did not allow the birds of the air to feed on them by day, nor the wild animals by night. When David was told what Rizpah, daughter of Ea, Saul's concubine, had done, he went and took the bones of Saul and of his son Jonathan from the leaders of Jabesh Gilead. They had secretly taken them from the plaza at Bethshan. It was there that Philistines publicly exposed their corpses after they had killed Saul at Gilboa. David brought the bones of Saul and of Jonathan his son from there. They also gathered up the bones of those who had been executed. They buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin at Zela, in the grave of his father Kish. After they had done everything that the king had commanded, God responded to their prayers for the land. Another battle was fought between the Philistines and Israel. So David went down with his soldiers and fought the Philistines. David became exhausted. Now Ishbi Benob, one of the descendants of Rapha, had a spear that weighed 300 bronze shekels, and he was armed with a new weapon. He had said that he would kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to David's aid, striking the Philistine down and killing him. Then David's men took an oath, saying, You will not go out to battle with us again. You must not extinguish the lamp of Israel. Later there was another battle with the Philistines, this time in Gob. On that occasion, Sibachai the Hushathite killed Saph, who was one of the descendants of Rapha. Yet another battle occurred with the Philistines in Gob. On that occasion, Elhanan, the son of Jair, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Yet another battle occurred in Gath. On that occasion, there was a large man who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in all. He too was a descendant of Rapha. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of David's brother Shimea, killed him. These four were the descendants of Rapha, who lived in Gath. They were killed by David and his soldiers. God, I'm not sure which I'm more surprised by. Joab stopping and listening to a woman, or a woman once again 
killing off the the main person in the story. Um, I didn't think Joab listened to anybody <laughs> except for what he wanted to do. It's a little bit devious, that one. But it reminded me of something that we constantly need to be aware of. And that is, you communicate with us in all different ways. Um, in fact, it almost humors me how many different ways you communicate with me. Um, you have communicated with me via Facebook, uh, email, billboards. And there was even that weird text thing that came through. <laughs> but one of the main ways you communicate with us is by other people you put in our lives. And I think instead of having blinders on as to who is coming into our life and what message they're bringing, if we take those blinders off, we'll have an opportunity to hear you even better. I'm sure, without a doubt, that Joab wasn't expecting what that woman had to tell him, much less what was going to happen uh, following that. But I think about that in our own lives as you send people in that may just incredibly surprise us with their insight, um, with their gentleness, uh, with their compassion, maybe with an opportunity or advice that we actually need at that time. I always am just in awe when you send people into my life and, and they say or do or act in a way that I exactly need um, that you and I had just been talking about. And what is funny is they usually don't do it in a way that I expected. So <laughs> that's what I'm saying about we've got to be really careful about not having blinders on or filters that we could be getting answers from you and being shown uh, the path that we're supposed to walk all the time. But if we expect the answer in a certain way, in a certain fashion, uh, carried out in a certain way, number one, it's all about us. We think this is how you should run the world, God. Um, and two, we could miss this incredible opportunity to possibly meet somebody new, um, see you work in ways that just grow our faith. Uh, a few of the ways you've communicated with me have surprised me still to this day. Uh, and I love telling those stories. Plus, we could potentially miss out on an opportunity of hearing from you. And God, I want to always work on our relationship. I want to always grow. I want to go through any of the so-called bad areas of my life and learn what it is that you need, need me to know and need to teach me. I just want to continue to grow closer and closer to you. So God, I just ask that you pull down any blinders I have. You pull down any filters that I'm using. And I just open up my heart and my mind to all the possibilities, no matter where they come from, believer or unbeliever, a man or woman, <laughs> who knows what you'll do. You are all powerful, all knowing, and are in control of everything in this world. Um, I don't know why I keep acting surprised <laughs> by that. God, you're just amazing. I love you so much. In your son's name I pray. Amen.